Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to a Wednesday edition of the Virtual Center for the study of the Constitution and civic responsibility. Today is Wednesday. It is the 27th day of September in the year 2017, and it is a pleasure to be with you. Let me let me tell you that we are live. We were not live yesterday. Uh, I had mentioned on Monday's program that we would not be doing a live program yesterday. I had to. I spent eight hours on the road yesterday making a round trip to Richmond, Virginia, and back in order to drop off my income taxes and hopefully keep my butt out of jail, as they say. Uh, I I did get an extension last year, and the extension uh, is up uh, in the middle of October. So uh, it was absolutely imperative that I get my taxes done. And rather than uh, go through them through the mail, I, I my wife and I decided that we would – Take the day, drive to Richmond, have lunch, turn around, and come back, and that's exactly what we did. We did. We didn't get back till 9:30 last evening. So, but we had a good day. It's the first day we spent together in a long time. So, uh, uh, we 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 both kind of in kind of enjoyed it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you live today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the virtual center every day, and uh, uh, I I appreciate uh, the continued support uh, that I receive. Uh, from Bob Kincaid and Agnes and the folks at the Head On Radio Network, and I especially appreciate listeners and and not only the listeners to this program, but the, all the listeners who continue to support Bob and and the and the efforts of the Head On Radio Network and the kind of programming mean, they, they keep on the air. Uh, I'm beginning I'm beginning to suspect or expect that the situation, the environment, is not conducive to this kind of programming. And um, I'm I'm very very concerned. Uh, first of all, that programs not programs like we you hear that we all hear on the Head On Radio Network are available and stay on. Um, most importantly, however, I'm beginning to see the beginnings of a situation where um, this is going to become more important than ever. Uh, I heard uh, yesterday, Those many of you probably heard this as well, but Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, made a speech yesterday at Georgetown University on free speech. And he endorsed free speech. Uh, absolutely. And, of course, the fact of the matter is he was endorsing free speech at exactly the same time that President Trump was criticizing those who exercised free speech, namely football players who took a knee uh, at football games at, at when the national anthem is being played. And so at the same time, President Trump is questioning the viability and validity of free speech. The Attorney General of the United States is out hawking free speech, primarily, of course, on college campuses and what he's talking about is that a number of college campuses are, you know, entertaining uh, behavior that that is in direct violation of the First Amendment and the free speech elements of the First Amendment. And he's he's correct on paper. He's correct. But I need to point out that when it was pointed out him during the question and answer session after the speech at Georgetown, that there was a blatant contradiction between what he was saying and what the president was doing, he dodged the he dodged the question and refused to answer it and refused to acknowledge the obvious contradiction. So in essence, what he's saying is, uh, in this case, do what I say, not what I do. And I th- I'm f- I'm afraid that's the kind of situation we're in. Uh, I was. Sh- uh, chatting with Bob before we came, Bob Kinke, before we got on the, came on the air just now, and I was talking about some uh, individual uh, personal situations that we are having uh, with various corporations, cable companies and utility companies and that kind of thing. What we're finding 
is that we're in we're spending more and more time on the phone with with public service commissions and attorney general's offices and stuff like that because one of the things i've seen in the last 4 or 5 months are much more blatant behavior on the part of corporations i think the environment being created in washington the you know the 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 head in the sand behavior of the republican leadership in the united states senate the refusal of the senate to take any issues or even any conscious notice of some of the behavior and some of the comments some of the vocabulary some of the personal attacks that are coming out of the president on the issues of free speech on the nfl on the uh golden state warriors uh on Stephen Curry specifically of the NBA, uh, of owners and players in the NFL, on and on and on. An environment is being created, it seems to me, that is frightening. And I re- I'm really concerned about it. And I more than ever, I'm convinced that programs like this are absolutely, absolutely essential. Um because ultimately, uh, when when you lose them and people aren't commenting on these things anymore, it's like anything else. When the same kind of behavior, however bad it might be, is condoned and repeated over and over again without consequence, then the fact of the matter is people stop noticing, people stop recognizing it as poor behavior. People accept it as normal, as business as usual, and the entire cultural standards decline as a result. That's to me, it seems to me, what we're seeing in a, in a number of situation, uh, situations and in a number of ways. I got in, um, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into any specifics here because, first of all, I don't want to take the time, and secondly, uh, uh, I don't know that it would be quite as yet appropriate anyway, but I, I, I'm in a situ, I'm into a situation where I, uh, it's a meta, it's a healthcare situation, a personal healthcare situation. But I've run into a, I've run into what I think is a, is an extremely fraudulent behavior and activity on the part of a physician, a local physician, a physician that I, uh, uh, was, uh, was referred to. Um, and the the behavior was so bad that in my insurance, my health insurance was billed, and they paid. But when I looked at the bill, I became convinced that this was fraudulent billing. And so consequently, we called the insurance company and raised serious questions about whether, in fact, they should have paid this bill at all, at all or whether they should seek to get their money back. And then after that, we called the attorney general's office, the state attorney general's office. At the same time, I know the, the attorney general of this particular state, and we're not going to get anywhere. We, we, there's no way we're, we're going we're gonna to get anywhere with this particular attorney general. I know that. So I'm not hopeful. But the point is that I'm beginning to see behavior on the part of corporations that are oblivious to the rules of right and wrong, the the right and wrong behavior. It's almost like all the rules, all the regulations, all the stipulations of, of acceptable behavior and not acceptable behavior have been removed. What I'm seeing is corporations doing just exactly what they want on the idea that there's nobody enforcing any rules on anybody. It's open season on citizens and customers. One example that just happened a few, uh, you know, today for, to us, we uh, were trying to cancel a television cable subscription and we canceled service. And we were informed that because we are two days into the next billing cycle, if we cancel today, we're still responsible for the next month of payment 
Now, you know and I know that when the cable company decides that because you haven't paid their bill, your service should be terminated, you don't get a month's notice. You don't get two weeks' notice. You don't get two hours' notice. Your service is terminated. But what they're basically saying is they can't prorate the bill. And we know that that's not at all true. So we're on with the, with the Public Service Commission and this particular state, whether we're going to get anywhere or not. The fact of the matter is we're pushing it. We're, we're almost getting a little bit of insidious pleasure out of doing some of this stuff. But it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely incredible. One more thing before we get into today's program. I, I, I want to thank Bob for this. I don't know if Bob is still uh, here with us, but uh, Bob made a point just before we came on the air today that since this is the Internet, if you want to, if you want to come out with an occasional bullshit or whatever, feel free to do it. That's what the, that's what the value of the internet. Uh, I try to be very, very careful about that. And I was telling Bob that in my classes, sometimes when I'm getting into some material, I, I get a little bit carried away, and I'll say something that's really not appropriate for class, and I know that. But it's, you know, it it, it indicates passion, but on the other hand, it's not appropriate, and so. I found myself two or three times apologizing, apologizing for something I've said or whatever. But it's just, you know, it's just the idea that you set up a point. You want to make the point. You want to make it very, very clearly and very directly. And sometimes you don't say it in the in the most acceptable way. But anyway, uh, I, I appreciate it. Bob reminded me of that. And uh, I think Bob said it was fine, Bill. <laughs> Oh, hey! Anyway. We're tag-teaming, so you're good. Okay. Well, anyway, I just thought, you know, you can, you know, basically what he's saying is if you want to swear, damn it, swear. You know, so, you in know, intelligent people, it's been found, they swear more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> well, maybe I better start swearing a little bit so I can... So it gets, <laughs> thank it gets you. someone's thank attention. You. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, Agnes. I appreciate that. Uh, let me uh, let me tell you that uh, right now Agnes is in the studio. So if you'd like to call uh, uh, and get on the air with us, I w we would love to hear from you. I know I would, and I know our listeners would as as well. Uh, if you call Bob Kincaid Horn uh, on Skype, um, and I'll be honest, I haven't done that, so I don't really know how how to do it. But um, Bob Bob seems to feel that. Many of his regular listeners know how to do it because they do it all the time. So, uh, but he said, you know, just uh, just call Bob the Horn, Bob Kincaid, at Skype, and and we and you'll get that'll get you into the studios, and we can do it that way. If you'd like to share your ideas or thoughts with me in an email, I'll do the very best I can in an upcoming program to share your thoughts or your ideas. I did receive, and I sent a response email this morning. But let me put a little bit on the air because I'm kind of guessing that that uh, uh, Grant might be listening. But one of our one of our listeners had sent me a a document that he's in the process of developing, which is which is fairly extensive. It's on a a proposed change to uh, or an alternative bill of rights, and um, it's premised by the concern that there's an effort to to call a constitutional convention. We've talked about that many times here on the Virtual Center. We're very, very close to reaching the magic two-thirds of states calling for a constitutional amendment on balanced budget. And our listeners' concern was that if such a convention meets, that's probably going to be the end of our Bill of Rights as we've known it. I, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. So in anticipation of that, he and I guess some others, I'm, I'm sure it's not just him, um, are putting together a tentative alternative Bill of Rights. And of course, my question, even though I haven't had time to go through the details of the proposal that he's putting together at this point, I sent an apology email to him this morning for that effect because I was out of, out of pocket all day yesterday. I really didn't have a chance to, to really get to anything. And uh, so even though I hadn't seen it yet, my concern was that if the mentality he and I both worry about 
is successful in calling a constitutional convention and at that convention successful in doing damage to our current Bill of Rights, then my concern is a more progressive version of the Bill of Rights, which is exactly what this uh, listener is involved in, would be, it, seeming, it seems to me, unlikely, at least for the foreseeable future. So I raised that question. You know, and I said, you know, if they kill the old one, then the, the, new one, the new one you're proposing, they would find more offensive than the one they just killed. So, uh, you know, uh, th- th- I see a problem there. But be that as it may, I really, uh, I really do want to get into that document and spend some time on it. And I thank uh, Grant for uh, sending, it, uh, sending it to me. And I apologize for not getting it to it as yet, but I just have been unable to. Uh, as I mentioned on Monday's program, I've been doing income taxes, I've been grading exams, and then yesterday I spent the whole day on the road. So I really haven't, I feel like I'm kind of falling behind in, in my reading and all of that, and I miss it, I miss it terribly. One more thing, um, our Facebook page. I've been putting material related to the class I'm teaching on our Facebook page. Many of you know that because you've commented on some of that material. I made reference to that on on Monday. Uh, I'm getting some very, very positive responses to the material in the class. And my initial reaction, as in general, not to any one particular reaction, but to all the reactions together, is I sure wish some of the people who regularly listen to the Head On Radio Network and to this program here at the Virtual Center were in that class. I, I, re- I really think it would add appreciably uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the academic intellectual level of the, of the class. But be that uh, as it may, uh, many of you have commented on some of the things I put on Facebook related to the class. But what, as I was, I was saying on Monday in a, in a kind of an apologetic way, since I've been putting so much time into that, I haven't really put a whole lot of other things on the Facebook page. I've been deficient uh, in that area. I did put something on the Facebook page today, and it was a link to this morning's article in the New York Times by Tom Friedman. And I know how... Um, how many people who listen to this program feel about Tom Friedman. Uh, Many people believe that he is the ultimate establishment journalist. Uh, And I kind of know where that's coming from because I agree agree with it, with an awful lot of it. But as I've said before, and I continue to say, the one thing about Tom Friedman that I've learned over the years is there's so much damn quality there there's so much depth and so much insight, and his contacts are so broad and so deep that you learn so much from reading Tom Friedman's columns. There's so much information in there, even if you don't necessarily agree with his point of view. The fact of the matter is there's a lot in there to be learned. His piece today, I thought was pretty special to the point that I made it a point, and this was very early this morning. My class met at 8 a.m. this morning, so I put this on the Facebook page about quarter or seven, about 6, 6.45 a.m. this morning as I was getting ready for, for class. I took a quick look at the New York Times and the Washington Post and a few other things I look at on a regular basis because I knew I'd be uh, joining you today, later today, uh, here on the on the uh, virtual center, and I happened to catch Tom Friedman's column, and I was so impressed with it that I wanted to to kind of alert you to it, if I can. I made a copy of it. Here it is. But let me share with you. The paragraph, it's the, actually it's the second major, it's the third paragraph in the article, but my, the first couple are quite small. This is the first substantive paragraph in the article. It relates to President Trump 
and it relates to the efforts that the Republicans have been engaged in to try to change the Affordable Care Act and do something drastic to America's health care system. And what irritates Friedman and irritates me as well is the fact that they're doing this without holding any hearings, without consulting any experts, without conducting any kind of a cost-benefit analysis, uh, no kind of, cons of concern about its impact on the public, on the general public. Rather, Friedman believes, and I think I agree with him as well, that all of this is explained by Republican efforts to erase Barack Obama's legacy in order to satisfy a few billionaire ideologues that have become so drunk on Fox News that they don't even understand who's being hurt and they don't recognize the ver that the very people that got President Trump elected are the people that are going to be most hurt by what they do. They seem oblivious to it, and that bothers Tom Friedman, and it bothers me. I don't care whether Tom Friedman, you consider him an establishment journalist or whatever. The fact of the matter is what he's saying in this article really needs to be read. People need to read it and think about it. I know that some people won't agree with it, but I think it's important. This is the paragraph I put on the Facebook, and then I put the link to the article there as well. Friedman says, surely one of the most cynical, reckless acts of governing in my lifetime has been President Trump and the GOP's attempt to ram through a transformation of America's health care system without holding hearings with experts, conducting an independent cost-benefit analysis, or preparing the public, all to erase Barack Obama's legacy, to satisfy a few billionaire ideologue donors, and a base that is so drunk on Fox News that its members don't even understand that they'll be the ones most hurt by all of it. That's a pretty powerful paragraph. And I don't really care whether, you know, how, how fond you are of Tom Friedman or not. This isn't the kind of stuff that you usually get from an establishment journalist. This is powerful stuff. And he's particularly interested on the president's refusal to consider any facts or any evidence or any expertise when it comes to the issue of climate. And then he gets into the substance, the body of the article. And Friedman says, there are actually three different kinds of climate changes going on at the same time. And uh, that's, that's kind of what I... That's kind of what kind of what I wanted to say. Excuse me for a moment. I had a my wife stuck her head into the studio there for a moment, and I had to deal with her. Um, Friedman says there are three kinds of climate change going on at the at the same time. Um, we're going through the actual climate itself, changing the actual climate itself. And Friedman says disruptive, destructive weather events are steadily on the rise. But he also says we're going through a change in the climate of globalization. We're going from an interconnected world to an interdependent world. And I thought about that for a moment. I'm asking you to. We've become interconnected as a result of the Internet. The world is smaller. If you remember Friedman's book in, you know, from the 80s, I guess, The World is Flat. But the fact of the matter is we moved beyond interconnected to interdependent. From a world of walls where you build your wealth by hoarding the most resources to the world of webs, 
where you build your wealth by having the most connections to the flow of ideas, networks, innovations, and entrepreneurs. In this interdependent world, connectivity leads to prosperity, isolation leads to poverty. And then Friedman ends that paragraph with a pretty powerful sentence, short one, but a powerful one. He said, we got rich by being American connected, not America first. Basically, what he's saying there, of course, he's making specific reference to the president there. But I think it's important to mention what he's saying about the president and about those who support the president. Namely, that the reason the president is able to do and get away with some of the things that he's been doing and trying to get away with is because the people who support him don't really understand the realities or the inclinations of what they're doing. They're buying into his rhetoric and not really appreciating what the substance of that rhetoric implies or will mean down the line for the whole nation, for the economy, for America's position in the world. The nature of the interdependent world seems to demand that you get involved in it because if you don't, the train leaves the station and you're left there by yourself. And you can claim to be America first or anything else because that is based on assumptions that may not be valid. Namely, that we control so much of the world's power, influence, resources, and wealth. That we're one of the few countries in the world that can make it on our own without anybody else. A lot of people want to believe that. The reality is, we didn't get there believing that. We didn't get where we are believing that. We got there recognizing that that wasn't true. That ultimately, we were increasingly participating and leading an interconnected world. And now that world has become interdependent. This is not the time to back out. This is not the time to take our ball and go home. The problem is many of the people that are supporting the president in his position on this aren't able to understand the full implications of what they're talking about. And I don't mean they aren't able because they're not capable. I mean they're not able because they're not getting any sense or any perspective other than the one they're picking up on Fox News. I'm using Fox News as an example. If they go for all of their news to the same place and they continue to hear one voice after the other saying the same things, they really believe that that's all there is. And it isn't. So it seems to me absolutely critical that we be aware of this particular aspect of climate change. And then a third kind of climate change that Friedman speaks to is the climate of technology and work. Let me quote Friedman here. We're moving into a world where computers and algorithms can analyze. By that, it means reveal previously hidden patterns. We're moving into a world where computers and algorithms can analyze by revealing, revealing previously hidden, hidden pat, patterns. Algorithms and, cons, and computers that can optimize. They can tell a plane which altitude to fly each mile in order to get the best fuel efficiency, for example. These are al algorithms and computers that can prophesize. 
tell you when your elevator will break, what your customer is most likely to buy. Customize. Tailor products or services for you alone. Digitize and automize more and more products and services. Any company that doesn't deploy all six elements will struggle. And this is changing every job and every industry, Friedman says. What you need when when the what do you need when the climate changes? You need to adapt. You need to be adaptable enough that your citizens can get the most out of these climate changes and cushion themselves against the worst implications of these climate changes. Adaptation has to happen at the individual, at the community, and at the, nation, the national level. And that's, the, that's a significant paragraph, it seems to me, in Friedman's case. What he's talking about with adaptation is the ability of our education system to enable people to become lifelong learners. This is a quote from an educational consultant, Heather McGowan. When work was predictable and the change rate was relatively constant, Preparation for work merely required the certification and transfer of existing knowledge and predetermined skills to create a stable and deployable workforce. When work was predictable and the change rate was relatively constant, relatively stable, preparation for work required specific things. We knew what people needed. We knew what skills they needed. We knew what challenges they were going to confront, and we knew how to prepare people for those challenges. That world is gone. That's the implication of McGowan's quote. Now that the velocity of change has accelerated, she says, due to a combination of exponential growth in technology and globalization, learning can no longer be a set dose of education consumed during the first third of one's life. In this age of acceleration, the new killer skill set is an agile mindset that values learning over knowing. People must recognize that they can constantly need to keep learning, keep adapting to change because the change is happening fast and it's important for individuals to stay up with it. That requires a total change in the way we educate our people. And obviously, it's a challenge that our educational establishment hasn't even begun to meet yet, except on a very minor, isolated level. The changes that are necessary in our educational priorities are happening at the levels where the few are, are acquiring skills but they have yet to address the needs of the many. And the result is that many of the many are finding themselves unemployable, are finding themselves left behind, out of the game. That's the individual requirement to adapt. Then there's a community need to adapt, Friedman says. Communities that are thriving are the ones building what Friedman calls complex adaptive coalitions. Local businesses that get deeply involved in shaping the skills being taught in the public schools and community colleges. Buttressed by civic philanthropic groups providing supplemental learning opportunities and internships. This is not just up to isolated individuals. This has to be a community effort to upgrade and adapt. Friedman is talking about. Local government then catalyzes these coalitions 
and hires recruiters to go out into the world in order to find investments, investors, in order to support these community strengths. The most vibrant, successful, thriving communities are the ones that have organized and come together to meet these challenges. Unfortunately, those are communities that are too few in number or in population. And then, of course, we need to see the same thing on the national level. We're not seeing it there for many obvious as well as not so obvious reasons. I believe that this particular article by Tom Friedman in this morning's New York Times is an incredibly important article. I think it's one that all of us should read and all of us should spend time digesting. I think reflection in this case is called for. I don't see it happening. In fact, I see just the opposite happening. On the national level, in our schools and communities, in the way we educate individuals. I don't see the ability to adapt and become a lifelong learner as a priority skill. It needs to be that. But I don't see our educational establishment acknowledging it or rec even recognizing it. Consequently, I don't see anything happen happening. Yesterday, there was an election in Alabama between, between two candidates that many of us looking at it, looking in to the state of Alabama from outside, wondered if this was some sort of a horror movie or some sort of a, of a spectacle, a political spectacle that was a, was a dry run or an experiment in the unbelievable. We had two candidates running for president, excuse me, running for the United States Senate seat that belonged to Jeff Sessions. The president, along with Mitch McConnell and the Republican establishment, had backed the incumbent who was appointed to replace Sessions at the time Sessions became attorney general in this administration. So he's been serving in this position. But the special election required that he run for the post. His opponent was Roy Moore, a judge on the Alabama Supreme Court, who on two different occasions has been forced to step down because he has re refused to go along with decisions of the United States Supreme Court. He's a lone wolf. He's a loose cannon. He wears his Bible on his sleeve. He believed that interpretation of the law needs to be consistent with the Bible. He believes that the Constitution, as interpreted, must be consistent with the law of God, the laws of God, as he understands them. They violate every constitutional tenet. that most of us know and support. He has been guilty of waving a gun, a loaded gun, before audiences. He showed up to vote in the special election on a horse. He received strong backing from Steve Bannon, 
He is seen as a rebel. He's seen as an anti-establishment candidate. He's seen as a standalone individual that will fight the substance of the deep state. He has in the past spoken out against Barack Obama as a natural-born citizen of the United States. <coughs> he has taken strong position against same-sex marriage. He has taken strong positions in favor of violating the principle of separation of church and state. He's responsible for a 52-ton statue of the Ten Commandments in the courthouse, in a courthouse in Alabama. And when ordered by the Supreme Court to remove it, remove it he refused to do it. And he was elected in yesterday's election against the challenge of another Republican who on two different occasions has been charged and tried for unethical violations. A couple of voters in Alabama made the comment that they, they believed that they were being asked to choose from two candidates, neither of which was any good. And in fact, that's exactly what was happening. During our chat before we came on the air today, Bob was sharing with me something that I didn't know. I guess if I had been around and read more on it, I would have, but I didn't know it. The percentage, the voter turnout in the election, 14%. 14% of eligible voters. And the media is calling it a landslide. Because the proportion of his victory over the over the, the his opponent was significant enough to be called overwhelming. But the fact of the matter is Proportionally, very few of Alabama's adult population participated in this decision. The fact that the media is treating this as if it was a landslide is sending the message that whoever the Democratic challenger is in the final election, which will be held in December, doesn't stand much of a chance. The fact of the matter is, with a turnout this small, Bob and I agree that a challenger stands a good chance of winning this election by turning out the vote, which didn't happen in this election. We need to keep in mind that this is the group, this is the party that has been engaged in suppression of the suffrage, in voter suppression. This party functions, thrives on small turnouts, on challenges, on voter ID laws, and various other things which make voting very difficult for a lot of people, especially the people who are most likely to vote the other way. To concede the election in the face of this small a turnout is not only suicidal politically, it's stupid. And I don't think that the Democratic Party or anybody else can allow itself to become so complacent that it can't win this election, that it doesn't even try. This candidate is an abomination, would be an abomination in the United States Senate. 
it would be a stain on every citizen of Alabama to be in any way responsible for sending this guy to Washington as a member of the United States Senate. The opposition must try, I believe. This is unbelievable. The media is predicting that the results of this election indicate that the power and the influence of Donald Trump is dissipating. That his ability to control the Republican Party up to this point is now over. That Mitch McConnell's reign is in trouble. One article in the Washington Post makes the point that yesterday started as a bad day for Mitch McConnell and got worse. At the beginning of the day, he learned that Susan Collins was the third Republican no vote against the Republican effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And then attention turned to the election in Alabama. And the amount of money in support of the candidacy of the incumbent, Bert Strange, suggested that Roy Moore's victory was a significant one. It could be seen as a slap in the face to Donald Trump. It's not quite as, co- as, as clear as that, it seems to me. It's much more complicated. Stephen Bannon was in Alabama endorsing Roy Moore. But his position is Roy Moore isn't the anti-Trump candidate. He's Trump. He's going to vote against establishment wherever and whatever it is. He's going to do the same thing that Trump is doing. He's going to buck the establishment. He's going to buck the rules. He's going to buck tradition. He's going to buck civility. He's going to be a maverick. Not only that, Bannon said, but his victory indicates that the ability of the Republican Party establishment to funnel money into state elections and control the outcome is no longer going to happen automatically. It appears that the establishment control over the Republican Party may be over as a result of this election. Bannon sees the potential of Republican victories in a number of different places as voters continue to repudiate the recommendations of the party leadership. And for Stephen Bannon and what he stands for, in terms of his opposition to the dark state, to the administrative state, to the establishment. This is a victory, and this is exactly what he sees in President Trump himself. So I guess Bannon's position is, on this one, the president made a mistake, But the reality is it's a mistake that's not going to bite him because in the long term, it's going to turn out to be a victory for him. That's the way I interpret it anyway. Major things are happening. And I think this election yesterday symbolizes a lot of them. I think it's a very significant special election. That's one of the things that, you know, that I see as extremely significant in what's going on in today's world. And with just about 10 minutes left in our first hour, let me share with you, we've already looked at Tom Friedman's article in today's New York Times. Let me share with you another one on a totally different topic. 
big banks. Big banks. There's an article in the New York Times this morning entitled, How Big Banks Become Our Masters. that I recommend to all of you. It suggests that the financial industry has really stepped out of its intended role in our economy and has begun to serve a portion of our population that A, doesn't need the help and B, violates the purpose and the intent of the financial services sector so long as that group is receiving that such help. The author, Rana Faru makes the comment that the Equifax cyber hacking cyber hacking situation which compromised the personal financial records of one half of the adult population of the United States. I, I can remember my wife making a comment. I hope my record, my stuff is not included in that Equifax mess, but it might be. Well, the fact of the matter is, according to this financial expert, the Equifax disaster compromised the personal records of one half of the adult population of the United States. Chances are very good that most of us are included in this particular disaster. And what he points out is that despite what happened in 2007 and 2008, in terms of the Great Recession. The fact of the matter is the big banks are bigger than ever. The taxpayers bailed them out once. And it's indeed likely that we're liable to do, have to do it again. But the danger, the threat, the author points out, is much more serious than that. Because he says over the last 10 years, there's been so much financial scandal, so many battles between regulators and financiers, so much complexity in the financial market over such things as liquidity, that a large part of the general public has become numb to the debate about how to make the financial system safer. Translation, most of us don't have any idea what's going on or how to fix it. We know it's not good. We know that a very po small percentage of the American population is controlling obscene amounts of the economy and that the financial system is not working to contain their power, but to enhance it. We know that. But we don't know whether, in fact, there, anything we can do about it. Even more than that, we don't know whether we should try to do something about it. Because they tell us this is good. We're being told that the more freedom and the less regulation the big guys get, the better off we all are. And we don't have the wherewithal to know whether that's true, false, how to challenge it, none of it. We are victims. And I'm going to read a paragraph because I think it's something that all of us ought to be familiar with. Adam Smith, the father of modern capitalism, envisioned financial services, and the author says, I stress the word services as an industry that didn't exist as an end in itself. Rather, it was a helpmate to other types of business, 
the initial purpose, the initial intent of the financial services industry, this article says, was to assist all businesses, small businesses as well as large. Yet, the author points out, lending to Main Street is now, has now become a minority of what the biggest banks in the country do. In the 1970s, most of what financial industries did, which, come, uh, which comes from our savings, this is our money, that these guys are playing with, would be funneled to investment in new businesses. In other words, the purpose of the financial industry was to serve as a mechanism whereby corporate profit was reinvested back into expansion of the system, expansion of the economy, in order to create not only more jobs, but more investment opportunities for more people, including small business. But no more. Let me hold one second. Here it is. I laid my article down and I couldn't find it. Today, only about 15% of the money coming out of the largest financial institutions goes into this purpose of servicing the economy. 15%. The rest is in what he calls a closed loop of trading of trading institutions facilitate and engage in the buying and selling of stocks bonds real estate and other assets that mainly enriches the 20% of the population that currently owns 80% of that asset base translation the financial services industry has stopped serving business at large and has begun to serve only the businesses that control as much as 80% of, of, the cor of corporate industry. That doesn't help growth but it does help fuel the gap in the distribution of wealth. The big problem, he says, is that our banking system would no longer even be recognizable to Adam Smith, who believed that in order for markets to work, all players had to have access to good information, transparent prices, and a shared moral framework within which they all worked. None of that is true today. The largest banks have really changed their direction and what they do. Today's business model has become, this, per, this author says, fundamentally disconnected from the very people and the very entities it was designed to serve. Small community banks who make up only 13% of, of all banking assets do nearly half of the lending to small businesses. Very few banks, very few assets, all of it supporting small business. The rest of it supports the big guys. What that means is they are using the system to become even more powerful and control even more of the world of the wealth of the economy than they do now. And in the process, 
They are leading a campaign, a PR campaign, to limit and restrict any efforts of government to regulate or control what they're doing. Even though what they are doing drove us into the largest recession 10 years ago since the Great Depression. We're risking it again, and the control factors that we have in place to stop it are being emasculated, not only by the banking industry, but by government itself. And the people in charge of the economy that this administration has put into key positions of authority. Mnuchin, many of these Goldman Sachs people who are who come from the financial services industry, who do not subscribe to the right or the need for government regulation at all. And they are in charge of the very industries that the vast majority of citizens look to to prevent abuse of our financial system. What we're seeing is that companies themselves, I circled this and put wow beside it in the margin, that companies themselves are copying this model of the financial industry. He says the financial industry dominated by the biggest banks provide only 4% of all jobs in the country, yet they take about a quarter of the, of the corporate profits. The largest banks are taking a huge chunk of corporate profits. They only provide 4% of the jobs in the country. They're taking 25% of corporate money out of the economy, the money that should be going into expanding the economy, supporting small businesses, creating additional jobs and investment opportunities, and all the rest of it. As a result, companies try to copy this model. Stock buybacks that artificially drive up the prices of corporate shares of stock are a priority. Airlines can make more money hedging oil prices than in selling tickets to people who fly coach. You and me, the ones that are treated like stock, like cattle, because we buy reduced price tickets on airlines and are treated in ways which are humiliating. Why don't the airlines do something about it? Because this isn't what floats, you know, floats their boat, so to speak. Serving customers is not what the industry is about anymore. Making profit is. Doing everything you can do to reduce oil prices, to save money, put more people on planes, reduce the legroom, charge fees for everything. All of those things which are driven by the bottom line have become corporate priority, uh, priorities in the, in the airline industry. Drug companies spend as much time optimizing taxes and tax breaks as they do worrying about which new compound to research. Drug companies aren't interested in saving lives nearly as much as they are in making money. And the biggest companies in Silicon Valley are spending most of their time underwriting bond offerings, just as Goldman Sachs might do. None of this is doing what Adam Smith envisioned 
the financial service industry ought to be doing in a vibrant capitalist economy. We literally have turned control of the system over to those people who are in the best position to abuse it. And we are in the process of disarming the regulators whose business it would be to keep them from doing this. There's nobody out there protecting our interest as citizens. And we're feeling the brunt of that. I guess what I would say, and I know we've gone over by about seven minutes into our second hour. We're going to stop and take our break in a moment. What I would recommend today in two pieces in today's New York Times, the article by Tom Friedman and this article on the abuse of financial service industry by the biggest banks are two hugely important pieces of information that I think all of us need to reflect upon and to digest. I hope I've been able to kind of convince you as how important they are. One of them, the Tom Friedman article, I put the link on our Facebook page, as I mentioned before 7 a.m. this morning. I hope you find it interesting. I hope you find it valuable. And I thank you. We're going to pause now and take our break. I know we're a little bit late. I apologize for that. We're going to pause for five minutes, take a break, and we'll be right back here and do our second hour with the virtual center. I hope you'll stay with us. The break will be short. I know the music will be will be worthwhile. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. Somewhere in Beckley, Dr. Bill O'Brien is tapping his toes and maybe even doing a little little chair dancing or room dancing. Let's check back in with Dr. Bill O'Brien. Hey, it was that wonderful. It is wonderful. Isn't that great? Oh my God. Oh, it's just great. Yeah, I was chair dancing, Bill. Thank you. I loved it. I I did I was tapping. I was tapping. You can't it's help fan- it. Fantastic. My God. Oh. Oh, thank you, buddy. That was wonderful. Yeah, that, that, that I, I don't know how you guys do it, but I'm telling you, that one is that's well, special. Curtis, that courtesy one. of our friend Chris in Germany, that's uh, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Oh my God, and, it's uh, wonderful. A tune called Joe Avery. Well, I'll leave oh. you. I'll leave you back to it, Bill. Okay, buddy. <laughs> Break a leg. Thank you, bud. Welcome to our second hour, abbreviated though it is, here at the Virtual Center. It's 15 minutes after the hour, so we've got a little bit less than three quarters of an hour left, but we can do some damage uh, during a short period like that. I do encourage you to, uh, if you're inclined at all, to get on the air and share your thoughts on the couple of articles we, we looked at or, or something else that we've dealt with here at the Virtual Center. We would love to hear from you. I know our other listeners would as well. Uh, just uh, go through Bob uh, Kincaid uh, Horn at Skype, and uh, Bob and or Agnes will get you on the air, I'm sure. Uh, if you'd like to share your thoughts with me in an email, I'll do the very best I can in a future program to get your ideas and your thoughts out there. And again, I do call your attention to our Facebook page, and I also uh, alert you to the fact that the, there is a posting uh, on this article by Tom Friedman that we looked at in our first hour. The link is on our Facebook page. I really encourage you to take a look at it. It's not that long an article. It won't take you that long. But it's darn good, and it's darn important, I think. I hope you'll agree. What I'd like to do this during the second hour, and again, I understand that's abbreviated, but maybe that's actually a good thing, because this is a kind of going to be a kind of a continuation of, excuse me, of material and thoughts that we've been sharing over the last couple of programs, and it deals specifically with the 18th century. I want to take a t- some time today and go back to the 18th century a little bit, and I can't help but sharing with you. Uh, some of the things that are happening uh, in my teaching experience before we even come on the air. I'm teaching right now the founding. Uh, and, and, of course, my the danger is that I'm going to get so involved, so embedded 
in this particular subject that I'm going to fall way behind and not finish, not take the course to where it's supposed to go, which is up through the Civil War. And so um, I've got to kind of constantly remind myself that I can't afford, this is a 100 level class. In other words, it's a freshman, sophomore class. And I therefore can't afford to get bogged down in some of the, uh, you know, some of the sources and some of the detail that would cause us to never get out of the period. Because once you get into that, one thing leads to the other. And, and you find it very diff difficult once you start to dig a hole. You can't dig your way out of it. you got to just basically step out of it before it becomes too deep. And I'm in the process right now of trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. But we're in the Confederation period. We just ended the revolution. We declared our independence. We won the war. That was the last chapter that the students read for their midterm exam, which I just returned two days ago uh, to them and reviewed. So what I was pointing out to them, and I'm going right back to that period, is that when independence was declared in July of 1776, the Continental Congress not only approved the Declaration of Independence, but they also began to take up a structure of government under what was then to be under declaration the government of the United States of America. In other words, when the Committee of Five, including Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, was appointed to draft the Declaration of Independence, at the same time, the Congress created another committee whose job it was to draft a constitution, a form of government for this new nation. And the product of that committee was the Articles of Confederation. We've talked a lot about it. We've made reference to it off and on over the months, over the years, in fact. But what I did in class was actually on, the, on an overhead, put up the actual document itself. And we reviewed it. We didn't read every article, every paragraph. But we scanned through the various articles in order to get a sense of what the Articles of Confederation did and how the document did it. The theme, of course, is republicanism. The one given that this committee operates on is whatever we do, what we come up with has to be a republic. Because a Republican form of government is what the people of this country expect. This is what they've been educated and raised to believe in. This is the government, the form of government that they are most committed to. A republic, for many people, is why the war is even being fought in the first place. Independence, without the creation of Republican government, would not be worth the sacrifice, many Americans believed. So the one given that this committee had going into the drafting of the Articles of Confederation was the need to produce a Republican government at the other end. And out of this comes the Articles of Confederation. And the first thing that I feel is important is the structure of the articles. It is very clear early on in the document that this is not a national government over the states. The states are very explicit in the Articles of Confederation that this government that they are creating, this 
central government, as it were, is not really a central government at all. It is what they refer to as a league of friendship among sovereign states. The states retain their sovereignty, their power. They are not delegating power to the new government, to the, uh, to the Articles government that they are creating. They are creating a Congress under the Articles of Confederation. And that Congress is charged with engaging and conducting the business that all states need conducted in common. In other words, the driving given, the driving factor in all of this is that the Articles of Confederation spells out exactly what the new Congress is empowered to do that the states can't do by themselves. If you think about it, there are certain things that you would expect a government comprised of 13 independent states. There are certain things that these states would need done in unity. The conducting of foreign policy, relations with the Indians, um, making sure that citizens' rights are protected by guaranteeing that the citizen of one state doesn't lose his rights when he goes into another state. The fact that states reciprocate on individual rights and liberties. That citizens are granted the rights in one state that they are in other states. Those kinds of unifying factors Congress is given the authority to, to conduct. But Article 2, early on in the document, makes the statement very clear. The sovereignty, power, and independence of the states is in no way weakened in the process of creating this new League of Friendship. And the Article 2 says that all powers not expressly granted to Congress are reserved to the states. There are two things to keep in mind here. One is the general thrust of the statement, and the other thing is the inclusion of the word expressly. What the statement says is that any power not available, not awarded in black and white to the new Congress is retained by the states. The word expressly means that none of this is interpretive. It's all definitive. By putting the word expressly in the second article of the Articles of Confederation, the drafters basically said, if you can't find the power given to Congress in this document in black and white, it doesn't exist. The states have the power. No interpretation, nothing about such and such being unconstitutional. None of that enters into the picture. If it's here and it's expressly given to the new government, Congress has it. If you can't find it, that means the states have it. The second thing that I would emphasize is that the Articles of Confederation only creates one branch of government, the leg legislative branch. There's no executive. There's no president. There's no court. There's no judiciary. Judicial decisions are made by special committees of Congress who are created for the express purpose of that particular issue. 
There's no permanent judicial establishment that becomes part of the Articles of Confederation. Neither is there an executive, a president. All the business is congressional business. All the business is legislative business. None of it is executive business. None of it is legal business. All of that happens in the states because the states are sovereign. What that means is citizens' rights are protected by the state constitutions, not by the central government. The citizens answer to their state governments, not to a distant national government. Also, the executive authority is retained by the states. There is a special committee of Congress made up of one representative from each state that meets while Congress is in recess. In other words, when Congress is in recess, that doesn't mean that there's no, national, there's no central government. There's a special committee that sits when Congress is out of session in order to conduct business. But the fact of the matter is any decision making is done by the states, not the central government. Each state, according to the articles, each state can be represented in Congress by any, anywhere from two to seven representatives. Some states have five con congressmen. Some, page, some states have three congressmen. Some states have two congressmen. It doesn't matter. Each state only has one vote. So in other words, it's not the sum total of the votes of individual congressmen that count. It's the vote by state that counts. And the way the articles read, any decision made by Congress must have at least nine votes in favor of it. In other words, nine states of the 13 must approve. I think this is I think this is significant. The principle is being established that decisions made on the national level ought not to be by small majorities. They ought to be by large majorities, super majorities. Like today's requirement that the Senate requires 60 votes, not 51. and the idea of a filibuster, these are remnants of the idea that from the very beginning, the decision was that we don't want all of the states to have to find a way to live with decisions made by seven of them, which forced the other six to go along. In other words, we don't want decisions that are seven to six. What the article says is, if they're not at least nine to four, they aren't valid. Important decisions, like amending the articles, changing the structure of government, those kinds of things. Taxes, not taxes, because the, the government can't tax. We'll get to that in a minute. The major things require a unanimous vote of all the states. They have to be supported by 13 votes. All of this structure speaks to the desire of the drafters to implement the Articles of Confederation, which follows the dictates of Republican government. What I'm saying, what I said to the students in the class, is that you can see the priorities of republicanism reflected in the structure of the Articles of Confederation. 
the priorities of republicanism are popular participation, government decision, government's power relies not on just a small number of citizens, but all citizens, the participation of large numbers of citizens in elections. The idea of the size of voter turnouts is critical because the legitimacy of government's ability to govern is driven by the participation of citizens. The founders would have been shocked by Alabama's results yesterday proposing a candidate for the Senate of the United States when only 14% of the eligible electorate turned out to vote, that to them is a disgrace. It really renders the decision in their minds illegitimate. So it's very obvious that the structure of the articles reflect the efforts of Congress to create a Republican government. By putting power in the legislative branch, no no judiciary, no executive, all power is in the legislative branch. All power is in the branch which directly communicates with the voters. The people's input is into the legislative branch. And the legislative branch is the government under the Articles. Requiring that congressmen run for re-election every year, annually. Frequent elections. In other words, you can go up and down the list of provisions in the Articles. And you see efforts to implement republicanism all the way through it. But besides the national government being created with independence, the states are also asked to adopt new constitutions for their states. They are now no longer colonies of England. They are now independent sovereign states. And therefore, they need their own structure of government, their own constitutions. In a few cases, most of them being in New England, citizens kept the charter that originally set up the state, except they took the king out of it. They took parliament out of it. But for the most part, most of the states drafted new constitutions. Seven of them included bills of rights. The protection of citizen rights was a government priority. And so the state governments reflected also the values of republicanism. Elections were annual. Protection of individual rights. Power in the legislative branch. Now, whereas there was no president under, at the national level, in most of the state, in the states, there was a governor. There was an executive branch. But they made damn sure that the governor was dependent on the legislature for salary and for power. In most cases, governors were denied the right to veto laws. Massachusetts was an exception. That constitution was drafted principally by John Adams. Adams was convinced that you wouldn't have a stable government if all decision-making was in the legislative branch. Adams believed that the power of the executive, of the governor, was critical. Therefore, in Massachusetts, the governor was given the power to veto. But legislatures were given the power to override the veto. The idea was that government would be as close to the people as possible. 
the mere fact that the Articles of Confederation made the state sovereign speaks to that. Power is in the states, not the central government. Power is as close to the people as you can put it. And that, I would suggest to you, is an effort to implement republicanism in the state constitutions. Now the problem that we have to address is where are the weaknesses in this? The model that they use in drafting the articles is Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. Montesquieu, we, met, we dealt with this before, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. But you, many of us re will remember Montesquieu's position is that republicanism demanded small republics. Government had to be small. The area, the constituency, the district had to be small because republicanism depended on the interaction between elected representatives and voters. They had to be able to communicate and, and share information and ideas and thoughts. So in order to make sure that government remained small, the articles re retained power within the states. The idea is if you shift power to the central government, you're rendering republicanism inoperable. The only way to make it work is to make sure that power is as close to the people as you can put it. And that means state sovereignty. There's absolutely no question that the structure of the Articles of Confederation reflected the priorities of Republican government as laid out in the spirit of the laws by Montesquieu. And the act, the, the, the supporters of state sovereignty throughout the period cite Montesquieu all the time as the authority on Republican government. And their argument is if you take power out of the hands of the states, you're removing it too far away from the people, which means you're literally jeopardizing Republican government itself. However, there are structural problems with the Articles of Confederation. One of them is excuse me for a moment. One of the major problems with the Articles is the requirement of unanimous vote of the states to pass anything significant. All 13 states have to vote for significant legislation in order for it to, be, to go into effect. What that means is if a state was opposed to a particular business, a particular law being considered by Congress, all that state had to do was boycott Congress, not show up that day, and Congress was unable to do business. In other words, by requiring the unanimous vote of all 13 states, you were making it possible for one state to render Congress inoperable. You are allowing one state to control the fate of the Union. By not showing up, you deny Congress a quorum and you make it impossible for Congress to pass major pieces of legislation. That's the first thing. The second thing is the most important, it seems to me. And that is power in the states. 
if you locate power in the states, then what you are effectively doing is putting power so close to the people that the people potentially have the authority to seize it. In other words, you make majority rule much more likely than it would be if power was on the national level. This is Madison's Federalist Number 10. His feeling that the way the Constitution can work is to remove power from the state governments and put it in the new national government. By removing it from the local level to the national level, you make it unlikely that there is a majority. Because you're taking into you're taking into so many you're including so many minorities that the likelihood is there won't even be a majority. And by including all thirteen states in the national you know, in the national constituency, as it were, by their very separation even if there is a majority, those who are members of it won't know that they are a majority. In other words, the thing about a majority is that until it can organize, it doesn't exist. And if decisions are going to be made, somebody's going to make them. If it's not the majority making them, it's the minority making them. By putting power on the state level, the Articles puts power so close to the people that it becomes more possible to organize majorities within states. Once you have a majority, it's in power in a republic, in a popular government. By definition, if you're going to have mass participation of all your citizens then by definition, majority rules in popular government. So if you allow there to be a majority, it has power. The only way to prevent majority rule is to make sure that there is never a majority. Consequently, what the Articles of Confederation does is make majority rule democracy more possible than it ever was or ever again will be in the United States of America. Those years when the government of the United States functioned under the Articles of Confederation is the most democratic period that this nation ever saw. Because power was potentially in the hands of the people more than it ever has been before or ever would be again. How is that true? Because within the states, there are elect electoral districts created. In other words, elect representatives are being elected to state legislatures. The powers in the legislature, not in the governor, not in the judicial branch, but in the legislative branch. So you're putting power not only close to the people by putting it in the states. By putting it in the legislative branch, you're putting it in that branch of government closest to the people as well. And then you're carving the state off into electoral districts. What you're doing is shrinking the electorate. By putting, it at the, putting power at the state level, you've shrunk the electorate from a national constituency to a state constituency. Now you're carving up the state constituency into districts, which means you're shrinking the electorate even more. It's smaller and smaller. And since it becomes smaller it becomes easier 
for a majority to exist and more important for a majority to organize. Political leaders, demagogues in the state level, on the state level, can organize majority factions and take control of state legislatures that way. Hey, Bill. And if, yes, Bob. Uh, I have a question coming in via email for you. Okay. Uh, Todd in South Carolina uh, just sent the following to me. Um, Please ask Dr. O'Brien how we can convince more than one-third of the country that education and science are important and allow people to make informed decisions as opposed to ill-informed decisions when it comes to the voting process. It appears that many people have become jaded when it comes to the federal voting process. At the same time, it seems that folks who have, been, who have less than adequate understanding of all the facts and nuances are voting at a higher rate and seeing results from their votes as positive. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that might be that might uh, take up the last twelve minutes of the program. No, that's or so, that's but... good. No, so basically, what he's saying is a minority is running the country. Well, yeah, yeah, and he wants a solution to it. Right. He wants to he wants to know how you can how you get more than a third of the country to understand that education and science matter. It seems to me you can't do it unless you have an educated population. I, that, that's my answer, Bob. You know, it was interesting because after class this morning when I was walking home, I was thinking about – I was really – I was thinking about this very thing because I was thinking about the class and about the Articles of Confederation and all the rest of it and the difference between minority factions and majority factions. And the one thing that, that we know – for example, is that most of these people that we call the founders, most of the most prominent people in politics during this period in all the various states, supported the idea of a quality education. They support, if they were advocates of a republic, they believed in the need for people to be educated. Now, the difference is what kind of education, what did they anticipate these people doing? And so you have a, a position like that one taken by Jefferson, which is you provide minimal education for everybody so they can participate, but you don't challenge them with the kind of education that's meant only for the leadership. And then you have other people that believe just the opposite. But the fact of the matter is, you have, it seems to me, a choice on the part of these people. If you want republicanism, it's got to be combined with, a, with an educated electorate. Because if peoples are going to participate in mass, they need to be educated enough to understand what they're doing. And the fact of the matter is, if you really educate them into understanding what they're doing, then they're also going to understand why it's important that they do it. In other words, why it's important that they vote. It seems to me that if you're going to have a republic, you've got two choices. And that is you can have the majority make the, the minority, the, the qualified people make the decision for everybody else. Because everybody else is too stupid to participate intelligently. Or the alternative is you don't have a Republican form of government at all. You have a majority rule democracy where stupid people run things. And so it seemed to me that the only viable alternative to this, if you're going to allow your people to participate, is make sure they're, ed they're educated enough to participate wisely. I don't think that's happening. I think that what's happening in our national politics today is sending the message to people that there really isn't any difference between the major parties. The only difference is the difference being made by somebody like Donald Trump. And that is bucking the system, challenging the establishment. Only a minority of people feel that way, but right now, they've been able to seize power. Part of the reason...
reason is because they're funded by big money, by ideolog ideological billionaires. I think Tom Friedman talks about that in his article this morning. Billionaire ideologues who are handpicking and funding candidates in order to get them into office to do their bidding. And at the same time, the vast majority of citizens are being discouraged by being taught that their participation doesn't matter anywhere and they're a hell of a lot better off if they just give in to decisions being made by people who are more qualified than they are to make them. I think that's the problem. I think if we're going to have a Republican form of government, if we're going to encourage mass participation, we have an obligation to educate our people and educate them well. I think the two go hand in hand. I think what we have is a situation where too many people are participating in government that don't really know what they're doing. They're being bought. They're being conned. They're being sold a bill of goods. I really believe that. So I think, in effect, that minorities are controlling decision-making in this country under the heading of Republican government. And they're basically getting the people, whatever, the, however you define the people, as, ratif as willing to ratify this kind of a situation. But they are minorities. The, the majority of the electorate that really, and those that really understand what's going on, unfortunately have backed out of the system and are not participating. That's the problem. When you have 14% voting in the in the Alabama election for you know for the election between Strange and and uh, and Roy and Roy Moore uh, it seems to me it's a disaster I mean that is that is unbelievable and so uh, you know what it what it is is minority government it seems to me it's it's uh, it's factional government it's extremely dangerous and it's bad. These people are being elected to sabotage the establishment and, they're be, and their elections are being funded by people who are out to do that. In other words, it's, it's a battle for power at the national level and ignorant people are being persuaded to do their bidding. I, I, think, I think that that's really what's going on, Bob. I, I, know, I don't know whether that makes any sense. I'd be interested in your thoughts if you have. I'm sure you have thoughts on this also. But anyway, that's that's kind of where I am. And I appreciate the email. And I appreciate the question because it's a damn good one. What do you do about a situation when the turnout at our elections is so small? The vast majority of citizens are turned off by the whole system. I think what we're seeing on the national level in the behavior and the comments of the president is a campaign, whether it's, whether it's um, intentional or not, what's happening is that there, is a, a, there are positions being taken on the national level which are discouraging people from participating by suggesting that the only participants that really ought to be able to participate are the ones that agree with us. And if you don't agree with us, then we're all better off if you don't participate at all. I really think that that feeds this cynicism that's in the country anyway. Uh, there were a number of people in the last election this past November, presidential election, who wouldn't vote for either Hillary or Donald Trump because they felt that the, re that the choice was a bad one. Many of them voted independent or didn't vote at all. The number of Sanders voters who are really committed citizens and committed to the idea of Republican government that works would not move enough to vote for Hillary, even though they knew that if they didn't vote or voted for somebody other than Hillary, they were taking a chance of electing Trump. They were willing to do that rather than cast a ballot for her. In other words, their principle got in the way of their brain, it seems to me. 
and I know Bob can agree that he and I chatted many, many times about this. And we were frustrated by the fact that there were so many of uh, so many of Bernie's supporters that wouldn't vote for Hillary because they felt that it violated their principles. Even though by not voting for Hillary, they were effectively voting for Donald Trump. I think that they really believed that Hillary was so heavily was so heavily favored that she couldn't lose. And that therefore they had kind of that it was kind of a get out of jail free card. They could vote their principles and not have them bite bite them in the butt. And it didn't work. They screwed up. I really believe that. I think that applies to a lot of people. So it seems to me the answer to the emailer is in order to get the, the system back on track, as it were, we have got to basically get people to participate in the system and take power away from these people who are taking it away from us. We can't let them get away with this. Unfortunately, however, I think we're doing just that. And, you know, I know that this is pretty much taken up almost the rest of our time, but it's one hell of a question. And I thank the, the listener for it. I'd be interested in a follow up in a follow up to that. But right now I'm looking at the clock and it's 58 minutes after the hour. So we've got less than two minutes to go before we have to leave the year. And I just want to take that time to thank all of you for your continued support of this program and for Bob and Agnes and the folks at Head On as well. I hope that you'll keep supporting them, keep this network on the air. I mean, I'll be very honest with you in the time. I've known Bob now for about a dozen years, I guess. And more than that, actually, but more than 15 years, actually. And what I've become aware of is that these people have given their lives for what they believe in. They've devoted their lives to a political process of political education and dialogue because they are so concerned and so committed to a to government service of citizens. And the fact that there are so many people that are willing to consistently support them and still support them and keep their efforts on the air, I think, is astounding. I just hope that it's strong enough to continue because I think as we go, it's becoming more and more important than it ever was before. I want to wish everybody a great rest of the day on this. Here in the East, it's just a beautiful day. It's a, like a summer's day. But I, I see, you know, from what I'm hearing, this is not going to last much longer. But I hope you have a wonderful day and, the, and a wonderful rest of the week. And if everything works out the way we hope it will, we'll be back here with the Virtual Center on Monday at our regular time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so very, very much. I hope that you have a wonderful week. Enjoy. Love each other. Be kind to each other. And thank you.